what is the most sophisticated civilization then? It's a combination of several civilizations that seem to have merged into two sets of large civilizations. It's the best way to describe it. So let's dive deep. Let's do it. What if what you are about to hear could change your life forever? Deep Dive with Adam Roa. Okay, Deep Divers, this episode is so good. It is with Matt LaCroix, who is an expert on ancient civilizations and um, ancient mysteries and is very well versed at um, our history like our ancient history. And, and he's not just in the realms of the esoteric mysteries, but he's very well versed in the science. He's looking at things like ice core samples and reading the ancient texts. He's reading ancient Sumerian and Babylonian tablets, and he has um, made a career out of it. He is one of the leading researchers and experts on ancient civilizations for Gaia, uh, the huge Gaia TV distribution channel where they have a bunch of really amazing humans on there, including Robert Edward Grant, who was uh, on a recent episode of this Deep Dive podcast. And uh, Matt also is coming out with a new book with Billy Carson, who uh, runs Forbidden Knowledge, where they are going to take a lot of what we discuss in this podcast and actually put it into this book that is... Uh, breaking it down in a way that you can understand. So you get a chance to read these ancient texts and these snippets from them and have them explained. And that is what this conversation really hoped to be (laughs) because we explored the deep dive question of were ancient civilizations smarter than us? Because there's this idea that if we are later in time that we somehow must be more evolved, but we can look back at the pyramids and go, well, how the heck did they do that? And it makes you question, were they smarter than us? And this conversation, as we explored this topic, went all over the place in the best possible way. We explore ancient Egypt. We talk about Atlantis and Lumeria. We talk about what actually happened during this sort of extinction event where where the planet, where all of these ancient civilizations disappeared pretty much at the same time. And then what about all these gods and goddesses depicted as these giants, like these 20 foot giants that were able to hold lions as if they were cats. Um, where, where did they go? And do they still actually secretly run the world now? Their bloodlines on this planet. I mean, we go everywhere and in between. I loved this conversation and I know you will too. I just want to take a moment and request of you, ask of you that if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review. Uh, it makes a huge difference in helping this podcast chart and get found when people search for for things like best podcasts on the planet, <laughs> those sorts of things. And it would mean the world to me if you would take a moment to do that. Outside of that, I would just want to say another thank you to Matt for joining me on this podcast. And I know all of you are going to enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, here is Matt LaCroix. I want to dive deep with you because I know my audience, the deep divers, are just going to geek out on the wealth of knowledge and information you have around ancient civilizations and this deep dive question of where ancient civilizations smarter than us <laughs> because there's there's uh, of this idea that um, time, linear time means evolution and progression. And therefore any, uh, anybody that came before us was dumber than us, not as fast as us, not as strong as us, that we're always getting better, faster, stronger, smarter. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on all of this. And so I just am so excited to welcome you to the deep dive. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Adam. It's great to sit down and talk to you. Um, you and I met 
<clears throat> several months ago at the Robert Grant event, the guy sphere. And it was really cool just to randomly have our lives, you know, cross. And we're just sort of sitting there talking and, and um, you know, we had like a great conversation and like, we brought this up and I'm like, Oh, this would be an awesome conversation to bring to uh, you know, our podcast, your podcast. So I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you. I love the, I love the conversation topic. Um, that's certainly one that I definitely have spent a lot of time dabbling in. Yeah, it's. I know a lot of people who are intrigued by this topic of ancient civilizations, and very few who have some made it a life's work the way that that you have. And um, so, thank you for being here. Why don't you let people who aren't familiar with you know why you're qualified to have this deep dive conversation? Yeah, that's definitely like you've got to build up a little bit of a trust in, in what someone's listening to. And I think that it's important for people to get a little bit of a background of someone and what, um, you know, why they're why they should be talking about what they're talking about. Uh, for me, um, ancient civilizations, the ideas of um, higher consciousness and something deeper and more divine behind the fabric of reality and just all concepts of studying um you know, studying climatology, geology, um, archaeology, studying the world around me, it's always fascinated my life. It was something where I seemed like I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I had a lot of time on my hands because of the job that I had working remotely. So I had this enormous amount of time and I spent it just like learning as, as much as I could about the world. I was fascinated. And I almost did. It was almost for me, it was more like a um, getting like a, a certification and feeling like, oh, you understand something now in, in well enough that you can speak about it or understand it. And so I wanted that about so many things. And what was interesting is though, is that the going into ancient civilizations that we're about to talk about and getting into these topics, it was, I almost feel like that all the other stuff was important to be able to understand this conversation we're about to have. It's a, it's a multi-layered, multi-faceted conversation that requires an understanding and many different aspects to be able to fully comprehend it, like being able to understand um, timelines, being able to understand um, ancient earth history, things like a, a continental glaciation and shifting of the temperatures and, and precipitation of the planet, understanding like cycles of time, you know, like the Pleistocene moving into the Holocene and these time periods of these great catastrophes that have occurred. And from, so for me, I was, I was studying all those things and it, it just came along in this natural kind of push that was like, almost like air under my wings where I felt like, well, I want to keep doing this. I don't know where it's going, but it's, it feels like something important. And I had some really uh, amazing experiences, things like being like on a mountaintop meditating and, and having something where it's like, you should, you should do this. This is something that you, um, that you feel deeply within some kind of like a higher self, or there was like more of like a calling that this felt to me, like I wanted to try to explain and understand the best way that I could, who we really are, what our ancient history is, what role we play. And I think for that led down the road of truly studying not only as many ancient sites as I could from with whatever amazing technology or being able to visit them, but also reading um, all of the ancient texts and the things they left behind, these symbols and all of these different, um, th these pieces of wisdom from our ancient past that are telling us something that really truly blew my mind when I went down this road and it changed me as a person. I mean, how could it not? So yeah, and, and that's become a, a profession, right? So now you are, um, I mean, you're on Gaia TV and, and Forbidden Knowledge and all of these um, different platforms. And what would you, how would you describe your, your job title? <laughs> like what, what, how do you, uh, you're like a host, but you're also a researcher and a, a, an explorer, a, yeah, a historian. What, what, what would you say? Yeah. It's um, I have a very interesting position. Um, I do feel very lucky. I get to do what I love for a job and still also have all of this as part of my life. It's like almost being more in sync with what you're passionate about versus having to juggle two different types of worlds or two different realities. So for me, um, I got, I got offered a job at Gaia to be one of their like top, like their top research writers along with another person who helps um, create sh episodes for like ancient civilizations and other shows, as well as doing research for, for any show that requires like an understanding of if facts are right, if information is right, creating a good story behind something on how to tell either everything from self-transformation to ancient 
uh, lost civilizations. So I get to do that and I feel really grateful. But at the same time, like you mentioned, I have a very hybrid position because I'm also uh, on as an expert on a lot of those shows like Open Minds, Beyond Belief, Ancient Civilizations. But I also get to host things like the Gaia Sphere event, which is how I met you at with the Robert Grant event, which was, by the way, a phenomenal event. Um, Robert Grant is a truly um, brilliant man, and it's it's it makes sense that he would be working with someone like you. So um, that's that's where I am right now. But I also am a writer and I create uh, content like you do on my channel and on other areas. And honestly, I, I love it. This is like what I'm this is what I'm I'm here for. So. Yeah, you found a way to get paid to research ancient civilizations. That's pretty. That's pretty epic because most people are doing it in their free time. Um, exactly. And so, to to come and hone the conversation in around the the deep dive topic, which is you know, are ancient were ancient civilizations smarter than us? Well, I'm curious which ancient civilization you would put at the top, the top of the top, the peak of um, evolution. Okay. That's actually not an easy answer. And, uh, and let me explain <laughs> That's why. why I asked the question. <laughs> because if we think of these, these ancient civilizations, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just start in a place that most people are comfortable with, learning things like the Phoenicians and learning about the Maya and learning about the, the Egyptians as we know them and learning about, um, you know, later like the Romans. Like you go, you go in line, you sort of, okay, so these are different civilizations that were here. But really, this, this story that we're about to tell and what we're going to dis discuss is something that doesn't exist in any of those timelines that we're taught. It doesn't exist in anything that we're taught in school and in our modern academia, and it's not discussed at all by mainstream archaeology. This is it's like a, like a forbidden area that only a small group of people is, is really able, able to talk about because it's a, it's a crack. It's like you exist in a crack. For instance, you're in, you're part of academia. You obviously have to be to be to be having these these conversations and be able to delve into uh, understanding how to read ice core samples and understanding how to read like Sumerian. Like you have to be part of that academic world, but at the same time, you have to know what to what to reject and what doesn't make sense, and to be able to forge a path that isn't based on just like this one mainstream area. It's something that's a difficult path to to go in life it is because if you don't know um if you're not talking to someone who's maybe open-minded or, or on the same level then they're not going to have any idea what you're saying so this and, for and me, also reject it right Re like they're going to reject it. there's a cognitive yeah. dissonance that happens and when specifically even when we think about ancient egypt all of the new information such as the wind erosion and water erosion on the sphinx yeah. all of that sort of stuff yeah. is being rejected by mainstream exactly. Egyptologists because they essentially they've built careers teaching certain things and speaking about certain things. And to say that they were wrong would invalidate a lot of their books, would invalidate yeah. a lot of their things. And so academia as a whole is very slow to accept um, ideas that challenge the, the status quo. Yeah. And it's, it's not even something where it's just like a, a progression of being slow and it'll naturally fall into a better cycle. I actually do think that it's something that really isn't allowed to be talked about in some circles. It's, it's not, if someone was to come out and discuss this, like look at all the heat and all the pushback that someone like Graham Hancock has had by doing a show on Netflix that even discusses like the fringe of, of what we're going to talk about. Like just the outer aspects of saying, look, you know, there's there's archaeological evidence around the world and climatic evidence that shows that there was a, a high level, high technological, highly sophisticated in many ways, groups of civilization or civilization, which is what is going to be answering your question in a second, that existed during a certain, at least up to a certain time period in history and was wiped out. Mm -hmm. almost annihilated and there and all that was left was remnants of those and the problem is that um there have been many cycles of disaster that is talked about and we know that from like you mentioned like ancient egypt but from a time period of ancient egypt that's far more ancient than what we're shown with like the pharaohs this dynastic period of creating mummies and doing all that that's a, that's a later dynastic pharaoh period that has nothing to do with this more ancient period that predates 
what he called the dynastic periods of Egypt. And we call it the pre-dynastic period. And it's like the beginning. It's like the truly ancient Egypt. And what they state is that there've been multiple deluges or disasters in the planet that have come and gone. And you, you, as in he, in this case, um, this is the ancient priest of Egypt talking to Solon, uh, an ancient Greek philosopher and poet, telling them you only, re- you Greeks only remember one catastrophe or one deluge, but there have been many. And, and that you'd only know that is if it was, there was a, you were a civilization that existed that was recording that information. And you were something that you were carrying down and, and talking about. And that's exactly what we're looking at. Is it that, so what is, what is the most sophisticated civilization then? It's a combination of several civilizations that seem to have merged into two sets of large civilizations. It's the best way to describe it. You know, you're looking at the ancient, ancient Sumerians, far older than the classical period that we're taught around, around five or 6,000 years ago. Uh, a, a civilization that existed there before that you're talking about how sophisticated they were to literally uh, invent mathematics animal husbandry astronomy um academia as, as a whole teaching class, schools everything came from sumer but the problem is that the sumerian history is mysterious knowing how far back that history is mysterious, but then finding what, what potential- What do you mean to- mysterious? What makes it mysterious? There's just a lack of, of hard evidence for it or- they, they claim that they are so much more ancient than even some people in, that are dabbling in this field will even like be able to accept. It's Got something it. where they state that there have been multiple versions of them that have come and gone and that our understanding of, of when things happened and how old they are is like extremely skewed. Like and for instance- written in their te- texts? Yeah, and it's written in their cuneiform. It's this, this way where they etched in symbols in ancient writings and they, they put it into pottery and they fired it and created like a very hard material that could survive in these tablets. And they also did that, this ancient cuneiform writing in stone, like the Code of Hammurabi, but they left behind all of these ancient stories of like a time period that was so old that it's almost disappeared from like all human recollection. And it's- And, and how do we read that? Like, how do you read that? Because, I mean, I don't imagine, are there direct descendants from that time still around that know well, how to read that? And, and the, the thing is that those ancient tablets discuss something that, that's then later echoed by civilizations like Atlantis, describing these events that occurred that are, that are like crossing over from everything from like the biblical versions of, of, of writings, which I strongly encourage to be careful in some ways of, but, but not totally reject. And then up into these Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian versions of these ancient stories, all the way to the ancient Greek stuff, talking about Atlantis and the ancient Athenians, there seems to be this narrative that's woven together in these ancient stories that says, look, your history is far older than you think it is. You have risen and fallen many times from various different types of catastrophes and causations. But in the end, you are still this incredible being that is a lot more connected to the universe and connected to the stars in this divine consciousness that they all knew and they all writ- wrote about and, and understood and we forgot and we've lost it. And now people like you and other groups that are doing this work of trying to have us remember not, not only of who we are, but the potential of our energy and our creativity and our ability to be something greater than we think we are. They all knew that. And so to answer your question, I think a combination of the Sumerians, ancient Egyptians, and Atlanteans, and you could throw in potentially Mu and Lemuria, and they could talk about if there's the evidence for that. But those are the civilizations that reached the greatest height of our, our past and then largely disappeared. Sumer- ancient Sumerians, uh, pre-Atlanteans, Egyptians, yes. you said? Yeah, and the and the pre-dynastic Egyptians, and and, and then yeah, and the thing is, like, if you were to cross over, there may have been. Um, there's evidence that during Atlantis, there was another another civilization, in the Pacific, called Mu or Lemuria, and there is evidence that shows that that may have been um, influential in places like Easter Island and potentially like throughout Peru. And so there's a crossover of some of these civilizations like we have today, where they the ideas and the infusion of different places crossed in different parts of the world so it's bigger than we than i think that we can wrap our heads around in some cases and so 
are all of these the Atlanteans, the Lumerians, the um, pr the pre-dynastic uh, Egyptians, and the Sumerians? Is this all the same time period now? Like those civilizations, are they around all at the same time, or are we still staggering mm -hmm. quite a bit? What we find when we look at the evidence from basically, let's think about like the structures they built and left behind, as well as <clears throat> when we look behind at the writings that were left or whatever information remains, we find out that they seem to have largely reached the height of their sophistication during a certain time, time period, but that became unclear when they originally emerged. That's what the you hardest think, part. Do you know what was going on or when that was the height where they all kind of yeah. heightened around the same yeah. time? When is that? There, and the reason we know is that we have an actual geologic de uh, evidence. We have climatic evidence from looking at earth history and then comparing to the descriptions they left behind of these events that match so well together that then we look at archaeological evidence of their sophistication just kind of disappearing and we can hone in on this time period. That's this time period is known as the Younger Dryas. Now, what that means is it's an era of earth history that exists between the Pleistocene and the, and the Holocene. Now, that time period is somewhere, this whole area of transition is somewhere around 13,800 years ago. I like to actually increase it a little bit beyond the Younger Dryas because during the end of the Pleistocene was also having some incredible disasters and we can, we can talk about them too, but that time period of the end of the Pleistocene through Younger Dryas, so between 10,500 years ago to like 14,000 years ago, we find that those civilizations had risen up to the height of building the greatest structure that they had and had built up to this point where they were highly sophisticated. And then all around the world, systematically, we find they all disappeared. From in that same time period, they, every single one of them had risen in a very similar way to a height of sophistication, which makes sense if we look at um, how technology moves around our planet with cities and how a lot of places will adopt things that they, ideas and other things from around the world. And they slowly all kind of grow around the same time. What's interesting about that is that it, that um, means that they must have had communication like exactly. in order for that to happen. And so a lot of, of people on today's planet would say they would assume that they're all isolated and there's not a way for them to be communicating around the globe when we're talking about 11,000 BC. Yeah, and that's the thing is that what we're finding is <clears throat> at, at the least, and I, I, I am want to emphasize at the least, we find in extremely sophisticated maritime empires at the least. And, and, I, and I'm not unwilling to say that it's not, it's not difficult to imagine that we don't fully know how far they went because a lot of things that you can create that are more technological don't survive. Like for instance, our understanding of, of technological, like for my, my understanding of technological goes beyond far beyond just something like computers, whereas like them creating giant stones that they knew could survive and aligning them perfectly to specific car, star constellations and points in the sky and these different energetic points, that's a way to like preserve a sophistication and technology that could make it rather than something like if we were to see what metal buildings and or what um, what would be left behind from our like, like phones and computers you, after just like a several hundred years, let alone several thousand years, there wouldn't really be much evidence left of you. And that's yeah, this, our thing. current society would disappear with, with the type yeah. of disasters that we're talking about um, that happened during that period um, with ma possibly massive glacial movements. And uh, is, is this around the time um, of what, when Randall Carlson's work is yeah. really focused on in, in the United Eastern United yeah. States, <clears throat> and what would be essentially the great flood of Noah? Noah's yeah. Ark and everything happening during that time. Uh, that's the Younger Dryas period, correct? Yes, that's the time period we, we just think of as the last ice age we had on the planet. We have these massive continental ice sheets that I really think that people underestimate how gigantic they were and the extent of how they, they literally crossed from all of Canada down into the Northern United States through like the Great Lakes area. And then the basically the, the moraine of as far as they made it is basically New York City, like Manhattan. That's the edge of where the glaciers made it. Those glaciers were miles deep. 
and they were just carving and moving through the landscape. And we're finding evidence that those glaciers rapidly melted in like a catastrophic way where these, these enormous waves are, have been found in a lot, of, a lot of parts of the world. The Sahara Desert has evidence of a, a catastrophic flood that occurred there, as well as all throughout the United States, we find these enormous waves in these hillsides where so much water moved so quickly that it created potentially massive gorges um, and canyons off of the continental shelf of, the, of, the, of North America that are deeper in some cases than the Grand Canyon. And now those are submerged underwater now, but they weren't before. But the idea is that we're, we're talking about a colossal set of events that occurred on the earth. And is that, is that equated to a uh, meteor impact? Well, that's the, the, the two, there's two camps here that exist. And there's within the, the communities of like Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock up through Robert Schock, there's this, these two factors or these two theories that seem to be prevailing with the most amount of evidence around the world. And that comes from the fact that when we look at that, that time period of uh, megafauna extinction in, the, in North America and in Europe, we find like Randall talks about with the, um, the Beresovka mammoth that came out of Siberia, we saw a loss of 44 million animals, giant mammals across that part of the world in like a, almost like a click of a finger so fast. We're talking isn't about there, something- Isn't there a whole like, like savanna or tundra filled with the bones? We find, we're finding a, a giant, gigantic ancient graveyard across yeah. the Northern world. And, but it's not coming with this gradualism. See, that's where we exist in, in the doctrine of geology and anthropology and archeology span is, is a concept of just everything happens over like a gradual period, not mm -hmm. something happening in a very short time period. That's catastrophic. For instance, we're told that those mam 44 million giant you know, woolly, mam woolly mammoths and, and giant lions and tigers and all these beavers, all these like creatures, these enormous creatures, we're told that they, they went extinct because of primarily human hunting. But we're not finding evidence of that at all. What we're finding is that these, these animals suffered a series of events that is almost seemingly like out of something like in Hollywood. They're finding with the Beresovka mammoth out of Siberia that that entire mammoth was frozen instantly so fast that it wasn't able to putrefy with its with its uh, meat, and it was literally preserved instantly. And in order to do that, you would have had temperatures that had plummeted to 150 degrees below zero. And what are what are the trains of thought around how that could happen? Well, that's and this is how we figure out how something could happen by like how it did happen. So what we find on the ice cores during that time period and these academics that were exploring the, the tundra in the, in the northern Siberia areas is what they found that was really strange. They found that there were flowering plants and uh, trees growing up in the Arctic that should not be there. It was, it was so perplexing. They literally found this like 30 foot frozen fig tree um, or like a conifer. They think it was something like that, that was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles north of where it should have been growing. Okay. That tree though was found frozen with green leaves on it. Okay. And preserved. So what it means is that just like the mammoths literally going extinct, these like the hardiest animal on earth and freezing with being completely frozen with undigested food in its throat and its stomach, just freezing to death and having these trees freezing with green leaves. And then you take ice cores from, from Greenland and Antarctica and you say, oh my God, look at this time period. We find that temperatures soared across the world so hot and so warm that it melted all of these glaciers, okay? And then what we find is that when it makes complete sense, because then when those glaciers all rapidly melted, they flooded the oceans with fresh water and they destabilized the salinity of the ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream, by having all that flood in. And not only do you get catastrophe, catastrophes across all over the place, but you also get um, the ocean currents shutting down, which would then cause the temperatures on the planet to plummet. It's, it's almost identical what we're seeing on these charts and with these animals in the northern areas 
that shows us that, look, the earth changed so fast that it got really, really warm. And then it got really, really, really cold. And then it got really, really warm again. And during that time period, we lost an entire section of our human history, an entire chapter of human history that was our greatest chapter that we had ever achieved. And it disappeared during that. And, and so the, what causes the, yeah, and I, what, I can what go into all that. of it? Yeah. The two, the two causes that we're finding, like when we're finding these, these frozen woolly mammoths, they're, they're finding volcanic ash mixed in with them, as well as when on these ancient structures, not only are they, are they off by 23 to 23 and a half degrees off true north, showing that there was a, an alignment shift that occurred in the planet, but we're finding like vitrification and melting on some of the stones in high impact areas. So we're, we're talking about temperatures in the planet that had had gone so hot in some areas that they had exceeded 2000 degrees. So we're talking about chaotic earth. Now what caused them? The two camps are either like, like Graham and Randall are in the camp of these, this is a cosmic impact based on a fragmented comet that was affecting the earth periodically because of the torrid meteor shower. Now I used to be in that camp for many years. It wasn't until I started really digging into looking at the, the effects around the world and looking at these ice cores and looking at how the planet was reacting that I changed my opinion and became a lot more um, predominantly focused on um, Robert Schock's work with these massive coronal mass ejections and solar events that can bombard the planet and cause a lot of the same types of evidence that a cosmic impact can cause too. You can get, you can get desertification glass where quartz turns to glass from high heat. You can get that from a cosmic impact or a massive solar event. So a lot of the problem is a lot you're of the like evidence a, you're is left like behind. A solar flare. Well, something so massive that the sun actually goes through an enormous event that we've never, we've, we've never witnessed in our modern human history that causes a, a, re, a reduction in the magnetosphere and weakens the poles and literally can shift the whole axis of the planet and it can shift dynamically um, tectonic plates and cause enormous warming with things like um, with the content of glaciers and then cause all those disruptions. So I do believe that cosmic impacts are part of this and do play a role at times. But this event that we're talking about during the Younger Dryas, I believe was from a massive solar event. And I have some evidence and some, um, some things that, which is why I lend myself towards thinking that. Got it. Okay. So assuming whether it's an impact event or a solar flare style event that essentially completely heats the planet so hot that it then melts all of these glaciers and floods everything and desalinates the ocean, which stops the currents and then drops the temperature to freezing again. And uh, we have evidence of the, the loss of species like the woolly mammoth. And um, we can only imagine the loss of human yeah. lives and civilizations which is bringing it back to kind of our deep dive topic here and so if there was atlantis lumeria sumerian like if that's happening at this time and it now we see the world just change i i can't even imagine how i mean i'm we could say that the only reason that humans didn't actually become extinct is because we were so widespread across the globe and only certain areas mm -hmm. even remained inhabitable um, at all. And so I imagine then that might be Egypt or, or, or that might be um, the, the, uh, the fertility of Africa, right? Um, I'm curious now when you know that and you hear about that, that being wiped out, how do we know they were so advanced? Like what, what is the thing now when we're looking back at those times, obviously there's writings and stuff like that. But for example, if someone came across the, the Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter and they were reading about an ancient civilization and that's the book that they came across, they would think that we were very different than we were. Um, and so yes. I'm just curious how, 
because I want to get to that question of, okay, were, what, were these ancient civilizations actually more evolved and smarter than we were? And I'm just curious what evidence we have for even knowing how advanced they were. And that is the very tricky and difficult area because that kind of thinking and that open-minded thinking is what is really goes against any kind of mainstream academia, because that is about a gradual linearism of, of slowly becoming more sophisticated until we are to where we're today. And anything in the past is less sophisticated and more primitive. And so that mindset, first of all, we need to abandon that mindset. If anything, the amount of wisdom and the way we used to write and the way we used to be in tune with things in the past um, was much more sophisticated. The way we were more of a refined human in terms of understanding our role in uh, the, the world and how do we know that they were like that? Well, they left behind the blueprints of what their civilization was focused on. That's, that's how we know. So for instance, like if, if we looked at our civilization, what we were focused on, if we were somehow able to know, well, we would see that we were, we were into, um, into science and we were into technology and we were into everything that goes with a multicultural group. But what was our focus? What was our focus of our civilization? And the more you look at what the average person spends their time doing or what consumerism or through pushing a sort of viewpoint of how to live, um, we actually live in like a, kind of a very empty, um, a little bit of a meaning, meaningless re um, reality at times. Like just imagine imagine losing sight of, of not knowing who we really are and then just spending all of our time like, like sitting around watching TV or not like not doing anything that we have evidence that that civilization didn't have that kind of mindset of being a materialistic or consumer society or being one that was about um, um, not having the mind be more dominant than something else say, right? Like maybe like sex or something like that, or beauty. That's those civilizations left behind. Number one, these ancient writings that are so um, well written and so smart and containing these like secret secrets hidden within symbolism that they clearly highly valued um, academic knowledge, and they what the reason we know that is that they built these enormous pyramids and these megalithic structures that were tracking things like the zodiacal calendar and looking at the precession of the equinox as the Earth spins on its axis every twenty six thousand years. They're studying that and they're like following time, but they're connected celestial, slash celestially to these specific star constellations in a way where they understood that if you create a set of structures on the earth that mimics th those star constellations and you build it in an energetically specific place that harnesses things like the, the electromagnetic energy of the planet, you can literally create a connection from heaven to earth. And you can create something that enables this like ability to reach potentially like something even beyond our comprehension, like some kind of a star portal or opening up these gates to higher consciousness where we become in tune with like the entire universe. This seems like what this, these civilizations knew all about that. And they had these weird aspects that point towards things like these really, really long longevity times of these specific royal families in like Egypt and in Sumer and in Atlantis that is like, it's really strange to read about. But not only that, and you brought up the idea of like Harry Potter or these other books that are sort of fantasy. How could we know that these aren't fantasy? Because the specific places that they're talking that these kings ruled that they say are like a, some divine being that's not, that's like unique and different that somehow has like a bloodline or something. They stated that those kings ruled for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And they specifically talked about cities and areas that we have found today. So what is theoretical and what sounds fantastic, we then go and we find it. And then we start excavating it and, we're, and everything matches the descriptions of that place. And all of a sudden what seemed fantastical was a real story. It was something, but it's something that it's, it's written in a very clever, like allegorical way in metaphorical way, where unless you understand what is literal versus what's symbolic, you're not going to understand it. It was like, in, and they talked about that. They called it this idea of knowledge being something that was protected for people that could understand it. 
like they call them like the initiates and people, and they didn't want knowledge in the wrong hands. And I know that sounds strange, but they realized they said, they talked about how in these, in some of the tablets that there's some people that use certain knowledge for bad reasons, or they don't use it in the right way. Like maybe they, they use it to control people or they use it to rule over others in, in a, in a, in a harmful way. And so they talked about how there's a certain kind of person that follows these teachings left behind that they had been taught from other civilizations that literally like were handing down these blueprints to how to be, how to be a good moral human and how to be reach like a divine nature of ourselves and how we used to be very different and connected to something that we we've lost more and more of each time. Well, what's interesting about this to me is if, if I'm, looking at it through sort of a fractal lens where what's happening on um, the uh, collective global level is happening internally, right? Um, well, I look at where we're at now and I see that we are very much dominated by our linear thought and logic minded. Yeah. We've gone into an era of science over mysticism. Uh, we've, we've gone more mathematics rather than, um, poetic, so, so to speak, very masculine instead of feminine energies. Uh, if we're going to go into that yang energy versus yen. So I see that um, as being reflected just in society right now. And when we look at the balance to that, it seems like the balance to that is in the ancient texts when we look more like Eastern philosophy and Eastern yes. um, traditions and the yogic traditions of that's where sort of that yin feminine metaphoric way of viewing the world more, even more spiritual, if you want to call yeah. it that less grounded in the material um, seems to, to have originated. And so it's like a pendulum swing. And I'm curious if that if that was, if the pendulum swing happened at this time that we're talking about, so when these when these civilizations went uh, extinct, then at that next chapter, it seems like well, we're now it's now going with the other end of the pendulum pendulum yeah. versus. Um, like, is that a natural cycle, I guess, is what I'm yeah. asking. Does it does it seem like a natural cycle and we seem to be getting more and more intense and the pendulum will swing back at some point after some disaster of, of being over here on this end for too long? Yeah, that seems to be what follows the, the logic of our past and the cycles that we go in. That pendulum swing seems to be based on the fact that the universe and our world and, our, and, and we are dualistic and polaristic and we have Nate, the nature of our light and our dark. We have these different sides of us and we are multifaceted complex beings. And after these younger driest catastrophes, it's described in ancient texts, like the Sumerian King list or um, looking at the ancient Babylonian King list, they discuss how there's almost this, there was a concept they use of kingship and civilization being re-lowered again after the events. That's, that's how they stated. It was almost like it had to be relowered and started over again here in, in more of like a, so that we would reach up to become that, become that divine state, state again. Who stated that? The, the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian tablets talk about how that existed before and that when these catastrophes occurred, they say that kingship and, the, and civilization had to, be, had to be recreated again. Huh. That's what, that's what they actually talk about in many different places is that there's something external to us and, and our influences. There's, there's external influences that seem to be part of this whole scenario. And when it was attempted to be civilization to restart again the way that it was before to mimic it, it slowly eroded more and more and it became very warlike. And it had a, a very, um, a very masculine dominant energy of war and empire building. And that is actually what has led us slowly into the reality in the, in the world that we live in now is based on the pendulum swinging in our, in the next cycle, the next, the, the next group, you could call it of civilizations emerging that went a different direction. They literally went a whole different direction. So I'm going to tell you about a crazy vision that I had in an ayahuasca ceremony and just get your thoughts on this, okay. <laughs> actually. So I was in an ayahuasca ceremony and I had um, this 
I don't know if it's vi- just, vi- just call it a vision. I'm not going to call it a past life or anything, but um, regarding Atlantis and this hyper advanced civilization, hyper advanced uh, civilization that was a part of a world that was starting to move into that warlike uh, way of being and becoming very, um, I, I, it's like the other end, this, this yes. other power <clears throat> is, is really happening and they see it. And then it was happening. We see that also, by the way, in like what happened with Egypt, where the kind of dyna- like the new dynastic came in and killed all the wisdom keepers yes. and, and temple did. holders. They just wiped it out. Right. Yeah. And, and to rewrite history and, and anyone who carried those old traditions um, were, were killed. And so there, that was happening. And this is what I was seeing in this vision was that was happening, but it was happening on a global level. There was like a movement of science and logic and masculine and patriarchy and all of that, that was, was sweeping through. And, um, this city of Atlantis, um, went into a spiritual, um, some sort of ceremonial, but, but more than that, like going to have an energetic attempt at shifting things and stopping things and brought together hundreds or thousands of, of Atlanteans to go into some sort of mystical uh, ritual and failed. And ultimately it wasn't able to get enough energy to shift it or whatever. And as a result to that, um, then what I saw was the absolute destruction of Atlantis and, um, what's I'm piecing it together. I love to piece things together. So when you're saying that it looks like it could have been a, a very real, um, like cosmic event, solar flare or something of that nature, that could be how it plays out. Right. That could be how the destruction happens that was trying to be prevented. But I'm just curious for you, you're so into actual history, what's written in these tablets, you're looking at ice core samples, do you get into the world of the esoterics, plant medicine, visions like what I just shared? Do they, can they line up in ways like that? Does my vision that I just shared have any relevance to things that you've read or heard? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I think it's impossible to go down this understanding of, of our past and who we were without being a part of that of that world. And that world of realisticness is that that world was based on having an esoteric mind. Having, um, yeah, having th- that world where you can you can break free of your mind and traverse, you know, these different aspects of reality because everything is not in a way where we think of time being linear. Time is more like a loop, and then everything that's that's ever happened has already happened, and there's no start and there's no beginning. So therefore, we can, perhaps it's not what we think. Like we can tap into an understanding of the past, even though we're not there now. We we sort of are. Because we still have this this fractal connection to if time's not linear, then then there's something like in the there's something in the ether, there's something beyond this this just this reality that's in front of us that we can tap into to have, like you said, at times having a vision or having some kind of a powerful moment that show us something that how could we, that would be impossible for us to know be, with conventionally because we never studied it or we just simply know it. And I do, I do feel that that plays a part in this is there's a spiritual esoteric deeper side of this, that it's like, almost like maybe the, like the old version of your, of yourself is speaking to you now because it wants you to understand something or whatever it is. I think it's complex. And I think it's, it's, it's incredibly um, deep in terms of not just reading something on paper, but having the ancient lessons and teachings about understanding the the illusion of reality versus what's behind the veil like the gnostics talk about that can only be experienced in heightened levels of consciousness and being able to have that mindset and so i do find value in what you said what you described in, with atlantis is something that's talked about in other places like the emerald tablets and others ancient egyptian um um writings that discuss how atlantis um like for instance we know that um, from Plato's um, Timaeus and Critias from Solon visiting Egypt, they discussed how Atlantis had become a morally corrupted civilization that was going towards war. They, they described that and how they were at war with the ancient Athenians that were like the proto-Greeks. 
and that the Greeks had a, a, a more of a um, more philosophy and more and more of a dynamic in, in their in their type of uh, culture where they valued the arts and they valued cre creativity more. It describes it as like a perfect civilization and that Atlantis used to be but became corrupted. And what you mentioned that's interesting is that it, it discusses how they use some kind of technology or energy or something mystical or magical to try to prevent something like that, like these earth changes or something going on and they misused it and actually caused like these destabilize the destabilization of like the earth or something. And then that's maybe actually they, written. Yeah. It's actually talks about how that civilization may have become so sophisticated and advanced that they were part of the demise of all of the civilizations that existed in the, around the world at that same time. Wow. So see, that's super cool for me because I didn't know that. And that's just a vision that I had in, in yeah. Ayahuasca. And, and what I find fascinating is um, just on the, mode of ayahuasca for a moment i had this thought uh because i think it, it's cordyceps uh mushrooms or whatever where they talk about taking over the host um and then there, there's this type of mushroom that's way up in um i don't know if it's the himalayas and how it works is they have these little caterpillars or, or these bugs that eat the mushroom and then the mushroom takes over their brain and then causes them to burrow and then stay completely still and it dies and then new mushrooms spore and explode out of its body. Wow. And it, and this is in a very, very hostile, like covered in ice sort of environment where mushrooms can actually take over and the mind of its host. And we know that this is possible. And it had me thinking, maybe when we do psilocybin mushrooms or ayahuasca or whatever, we've now just become host carriers of the consciousness of the plant. I am now literally just doing the, the bidding of ayahuasca, the uh, a cosmic consciousness or whatever. And why I say that is because the, these plants have their own consciousness that grow out of an earth that has survived all of what we're talking about and carries the history within it. The earth knows the history. Yeah. Gaia knows the history. We it's, it's in there. And so when we can tap into it, sometimes we were shown these visions and it's tough to know what's literal and what's metaphoric, you know, and, and what is just meant for you to have some sort of meaning derived from it. Yeah. But I do know that all of the ancient civilizations that I'm aware of had some form of psychedelics or entheogen use uh, as part of their culture, right? Yeah, that, that's that's a great point to bring up, and it's not it's not something that we should shy away from talking about because, frankly, we know that these rituals existed, and then we know that, like for instance, the lotus flower in Egypt was used as a psychoactive material during ritualistic experiences. And the only reason why they would do those, like we need to get out of that mindset of thinking one way versus another. But the only reason they would do those, just like it's shared around the world, is that they had these ceremonies and they had these aspects of understanding this world that they lived in amongst this ancient temple with this vibrational frequency. And they knew that those types of plants and those things around the world would help free your consciousness to become, to become flowing with like the cosmic or earth consciousness to something that exists on um, more of a theoric level, something that's beyond us. And that it's difficult for us to achieve that in this reality we live in because we're so bombarded all the time by so many th ways to think and, and all this um, energy of our past that's been brought with us by what we are told to think, what we learned and what others have, have, have shown us in that they understood that that veil, they, they called it a veil, the Gnostics specifically called it a veil. It's a veil of reality. It's where you almost like exist in a false reality because you don't open your mindset to seeing the world from like a higher up perspective, seeing, you know, this planet in the cosmos with everything's connected energetically and that we're this like divine creator being that's here having all these experiences and we're trying to propel our story forward rather than seeing it from the mindset of like, well, oh, we're just like a an, an unimportant animal that's here just as a survival of the fittest and just consuming and not doing anything. Those mindsets are 
can be difficult in some people to shift over and for us to realize that the infinite us, I guess you could call it, right? The infinite us that's inside us, that's connected to past versions of us and higher selves and something greater is it is, it can be hard. And we find evidence that the ancients realized that those were something that were, were part of cer- ceremony, but taken very seriously, taken in a way where it wasn't about like some kind of a recreational purpose for them, but something where they were doing it with an actual detailed purpose of something specific. And, and they, they, re- they recognize that. And I, so I, of course, see the plant healers and the things around our world as being something that help, that allows us to come back sometimes, because all we have besides that is, is being able to go into a meditative state and being able to shut our mind off and using techniques to do that. And it, it can be really difficult not to get lost in this world and this reality here. And I love that, that you're speaking to that. And one of the questions that just popped into my head is where did, let's just assume for a moment or, or have the preposition that uh, we have these highly enlightened beings that are somewhat human or not human at all, or whatever that ruled for thousands of years, the king. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if that would technically be what we would refer to as like Anunnaki as an example of, of that. Um, but these star beings that even in Egypt, right, there's all these like long headed, like when you see the drawings, there's, there's the rulers that are, are shown to have giant heads, like gigantic heads yeah. and, and be so much bigger than everyone else. And, and whether that's meant to be metaphorical and just, they're just drawn bigger because they're meant to be important, like some, you know, traditional, uh, Egyptologists would say, or that's actually literal. And they were these massive beings. Well, um, it seems like they were deeply respected and they ruled and they were, they carried, a lot of knowledge uh, that was was used to advance these societies and be able to do things like build the pyramids of Egypt, which yeah. are to this day would be incredibly difficult, nearly impossible for us to yeah, actually agreed. do. My question for you is, where did they go? <laughs> like, like I under, the civilizations still seem to be there. Some of them, there's evidence yeah. of those, but. I don't, where are these, these beings now? Why did they abandon us? So to speak after when, when shit hit the fan, I think the best way for us to look at it, to start, to start the, the, this conversation without people rolling their eyes or being pushed away too quickly is to just look at us and look at, and look at, do we, do we match anything around this world? That's like us. Is there anything that's similar to us really here? Not really. There's like, tiny little similarities that uh, some would obviously argue in some primates that are here, but for, to compare those two, those two sentient, the, the, that sentient being versus something that is like very, very much like a peaceful primate in, in, in with earth, just sort of living amongst earth. And I know some primates are not peaceful, but what I mean is that um, we are it's not, we're not that we're something else. And that's really what the ancient texts talk about and what these ancient bloodlines and these royal beings that they discuss is that there was something like a divine, powerful being that came here from somewhere else. It doesn't say if it's physical or if it's like something like an interdimensional or something, some kind of a a powerful um, being that's like us, but, but taller and they came here and decided to create civilization and create us in its image. Depicts what it's ships, and you can see depictions of of spaceships all like in a lot of ancient civilizations. It's our our universe or our multiverse or universe, depending on how you want to look at it, is so vast that it's beyond comprehension to think that we obviously would be alone, and that there's not another version of us or something else out there that's a civilized, um, conscious being because. It, it truly is um, mind blowing to imagine how big the cosmos is and how many star systems and how many planets. And we obviously just look at the, the, the vast amount of those and not want to be closed minded to something stupid, but to, to be like reject all that just based on our own um, small mindedness. But the, the point is that, well, the, the issue is that the, the, all the ancient texts, they talk about like, they, like almost like a sky God or something that that came here that created us out of something that was more primitive, but to emanate and be them 
to be something, something powerful here. But our mm-hmm. role was, according to them, is to do the work in like the physical world for them. That's what they described it as, like the Atrahasis is the most famous um, Sumerian tablet, is they talked about how they came here and they were trying to clear the river channels to, 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 um, to do agriculture and all these different things. And they, they say that it was like almost like these divine demigods or whatever called the Ajiji, that they didn't want to do any of this work of building temples or doing any of this anymore. So they created a spiritual at heart being that was in a physical body that could literally like be like a, almost like a steward or a worker of the realm of reality, right? Let's We're say. outsourced spiritual labor. Exactly. That's, and, <laughs> that's- and that's, so what, ha- what happened was though, <laughs> is that they had a lot of like powerful gifts and they were like very powerful beings. And we inherited and had a lot of those things in us. And then mm-hmm. we've slowly lost and forgotten about them over time. We have the ability it's now looking like something like, for instance, the great pyramid of Giza that that wasn't built like manually is that there's something that's even beyond our comprehension, something vibrationally related to frequency and harmonics, something to do with, with our voice and our energy, like where we can literally create and manipulate the world around us. It sounds like something science fiction or just something that's out of someone being like totally crazy, but they say that that's the way we were. And they describe some of these beings as doing fantastical things that the, that others didn't know how they did them. And then they taught them how to, um, how to create these structures and how to um, incorporate all the knowledge into becoming almost like a, more like a superhuman, like mm. a human that um, they had, they had, they were almost like immortal at that point. Some of them were living for thousands of years. They were so smart that they had figured out literally like many of the answers of the, of the cosmos. And some of these, the story goes that some of these creator beings became jealous of their creation and that because things had gone in a way that they didn't plan on, they allowed or created an event here to destroy us and wipe us out. Now in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of my favorite set of tablets that most people have never read, but have heard of is it's described when he goes on this journey to find immortality, he meets this, this, what became the biblical version of Noah. His name wasn't that at all, though. His name was Zayasudra or Untapishtim. And he meets this ancient king who is in like an ethereal, like some kind of another realm, like either the, like the underworld or some kind of a spiritual realm. And he goes and he meets with him and talks to him. And he, he tells him like a great story. He tells him Gilgamesh long ago when, when these cities existed like Sharupak, he says that the gods in, in this, in the text, he says that the gods once walked among them. That was like part of their world. And that when that event occurred, that almost caused us to disappear. Some of them were so angry or, and, and mad over the decision that had been made to allow it, that they, they, they departed and like essentially didn't come back. That they, they that's what it states. And that because some they, of them they left because they were so, they were so, they were mad at the decision to allow what the the us to be destroyed. So they they're like we're not going to even stay and help. That's confusing to me. They did though. Some of them left and decided to. Um, it's it states that some of them just sort of left our physical world and then tr- tried to help, sort of tried to help through um, things like giving visions. Like it's described that 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 um, Untapishtim Zayasudra character that he met. It's described that before the, the deluge and the catastrophes, that, that because a promise had been made not to warn any people, that he had a vision given, shown to him to on how to survive that event, because it was told that he had a specific bloodline that was connected back to these higher gods that needed to be preserved in order for humanity to survive. That's what he, so he warns and that's him Noah's through, Ark. That's Noah's Ark. But that's the religious version of it. The original right. version is called the Atrahasis. And it's that same story is, is echoed in the Epic of Gilgamesh, describing a group of like royal kings, very important people that were like sages and like mystics yeah. who were who were allowed to survive in order for our the seed of us to survive. Mm. And it's and described as that. That's so fascinating. And then you can go into deep conspiracy theory that that bloodline is now like 
you know, the royal family and Rockefellers and and those ancient families that have basically been in control yes. of of the this modern world in a very different way. They're not, you know, 11 foot giants that rule with spiritual powers necessarily in the same way, but they, you could argue that it's a very small handful of families that yes. runs everything on this planet it's, and makes yes. all the decisions. And so if we wanted to tie those things together, we're looking at direct descendants of, of quote unquote Noah um, and, and that story of people carrying that bloodline and instructions for how to essentially continue to control things. Yes. And whatever was left over from that event, whatever Royal people or were around to then repopulate and create these families and these civilizations, those that were still part of that specific bloodline or whatever they want to see like connection to to the ancient times they would rule as like a king so that that you saw this trickle down that started but then it got misused in the wrong way and then those groups then became using it for a form of like creating like an empire or like a corrupt kingdom where they where people weren't told and, and information wasn't shared at all and basically like a small group of people would know like all the knowledge of like the past and they, they started keeping in these small little areas. And then it led to this completely different type of world that we emerged into, which was based on like controlling information in these small little groups. And then really just like keeping people more or less like uneducated in the dark to rule over them. And it be, so it became like a corruption of a lot of different mentalities and mindsets that led into this world that we live in now, which you brought up even though it's not the same as having like a big king on the hill, a being a big castle on the hill anymore, that's overlooking like this village below it. It still is like this hidden hand of some, of a powerful group that now, because it, it can just be connected all around the world because of technology, they don't need to be anywhere physically anymore in a way where like they can just make decisions and the, the rest of everything sort of unfolds because too much power has been allowed to get in certain, the hands of certain families and certain groups. And you really can see that that has emerged in our, in our world. And we're only under the, under the, I guess you could call it the deception of being in that completely free and open system that most people think that we live in, where really it's, it's more about controlling information and controlling people in a way that's very cohesive and very, um, very, very sneaky the way that the way that we're controlled now. Yeah. And uh, as we land the plane here, because I could, I mean, we could talk about this for hours more, I, I imagine. But as we start to land the plane and come back to that deep dive question of were ancient civilizations smarter than us, it, it's, I'm curious now, uh, after this conversation, there's a part of me that goes, okay, it seems like there, there were some powers that be that that had knowledge and wisdom and powers and the ability to do things like build the pyramids that to this day none of us really understand or could yeah. replicate <clears throat> but it also seems like they may have pieced out <laughs> and and they may have left and so with was it really the ancient civilizations you know what I mean? Was it really the ancient civilizations that had all that knowledge or was it even back then a select 1% <laughs> to using modern terminology that really had all the information? And when they left, th we started over, so to speak, because they were the ones who actually had it. And it was never really in the hands of us, the outsourced spiritual laborers. It's, it's a little bit of both. One, you're right, is that those same influences of creating these divine cities with these completely different world, I guess you could call it, than we live in now, where there literally were like demigods, some kind of a, a half god, half human that was like living for enormous amounts of time. And they were doing things back then in, in understanding things that we just don't now today. And the thing was, though, is it's a loss of those influences, but also a trickle down loss over time of the original core of the belief system and the understanding that those people had, and then sort of, they kind of died out. They, I mean, they're, they're, they are mortal in a sense. So obviously they're humans and they can only live for a certain amount of time. And when those bloodlines slowly became less and less, which is what we saw 
after that younger Dryas catastrophes, which is kind of weird, but it's true, is that those giant bloodlines and those those type the type of person that existed started to disappear after. And Gilgamesh is 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 mentioned in the in the Sumerian Babylonian tablets. He's mentioned as one of the last ancient bloodline kings that was left, and he was a giant. It's shown he Gilgamesh has this famous depiction where he's shown holding um, a lion in his arms, but the lion has a, has a mane. So it's not a, it's not a baby lion. It's a full grown lion. And in, in those tablets though, he, ta- he talks about how he was like one of the last remnants of like an ancient lineage of these humans. And that's why he was a King. And that's why he went on these mystical journeys, but it states that he was one of the, la- the last ones of that. And when we go into books like, Deuteronomy and Book of Numbers, the ancient Hebrew text, and we start reading about these stories, we find out that there was a war later on after to go and like literally rid these bloodlines and like kill them. It's we know it in like the story of um of um, what's known as King Og and the sons of Anak in the land of Canaan, the area of Syria, where those texts to state that they were, he was commanded to go and essentially wipe out these kingdoms that still had these Kings that connected back to Sumer and that they were, and there was an area called Averis Egypt that was only discovered in the last 30 years where they found this huge catch of giant hands that was in this area that was being protected like a vault of these enormous hands. And the archeologists, these are their mainstream archeologists were baffled. They had no understanding or how these hands could be so enormous. But what they found were these, these records left behind that showed that the king at that time, Hythos, I think it was called Hythos Castle or Hythos King, was paying gold to hunt down and cut off the, the right hand of these giants as proof that you had killed one of them and then we get paid. So anyway, a long story short, is that there seemed to be like a cleansing going on of not only this ancient connection once had with the past, but also a destroying of the information itself to where now all that came out of that was like a few families that felt superior and and wanted to dominate. And then they created empires. And then that's essentially where we are still today. And that's hasn't changed. Whoa, bro. (laughs) There's so much here. And so I, I, I have way more questions, but we just, we'll, we're going to wrap this up here. And I know that the deep divers listening to this right now are probably as mind blown as me and just going, I have, I wait, what about this? And what about this? And so uh, maybe in the future, we'll just have to have you back on and, sure, and that'd be great. I enjoy talking one. to you. Adam. And I, what I will say is that I just want to acknowledge and appreciate you for the amount of time, energy, attention you have put into learning this. Like for those of you who are just listening to this, all of the stuff that Matt's been saying, none of it is, he's got no books in front of him. He's not reading anywhere that you you literally have this stored up in your head, all of these names and these time periods and, and these stories. And I think that's amazing because to be honest, you are all of these lineages that have gone extinct and the wisdom that has been lost um, is because people weren't willing to do what you're doing. You are actually the one that is now a wisdom carrier of keeping these stories alive and helping us remember um, the the histories that came before. And so I just really appreciate you doing that. Um, And also want to know offline if if you got some of that special bloodline that's the reason why and then you just let me know what i gotta do to get in (laughs) on that game but uh thank you so much man for being here can you let people know where they can get more of your work and follow you yeah so just a couple announcements and i'll give my social media but um i'm going to be at the conscious life expo uh february 10th and 11th well, February 10th is when, is when my talk is. So if you're able to come and you want to go to LA and, and go to a cool event like that, um, I'll be doing my own solo presentation. Then I'll be on a panel with Jimmy Church, um, a lot of other really great people. Come check it out if you want to come meet me in person and, and chat. Um, and then also the other big announcement, I'm sure most people that listen to me know, but I just released a big book with Billy Carson called The Epic of Humanity. And that's on pre-order right now. And that contains... Um, 
it's the, it's our epic. It's telling our story with all the mo- the most amount of ancient texts of any book that I'm aware of, all in one place where you can read these snippets from Egyptian and Sumerian and Babylonian and ancient Hebrew, and like you can get into the Gnostic stuff, and you can you can take what someone is saying and like have something next to it tangible to read alongside and be like, wow, that you know that what what is in that ancient text? Like, what does that mean? And then, so I, I'm really excited for people to read that book. Um, that's out on pre-order now. And for when anyone it who, release? um, it will, it's releases very soon. It's, it's still in pre-order, but we're, we're it's gonna, it's gonna be shipped very soon. Um, and then for anyone who's interested, um, I do a lot of really cool shows, um, on different networks and different podcasts where I love to share this. And if you want to find a lot of those videos, I have them on my YouTube channel um, at Matthew LaCroix and I am on, um, Instagram at the stage of time. And Adam is someone that, um, I really enjoy talking to. So hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put, uh, those links in the show notes here. Um, so as you're listening to this, you can click on it. I want one of those books that, that sounds exactly like, like my, my jam. So, um, I'll get a pre-order in and just want to thank you again. Is there anything else that you want to say or, um, you know, touch on at all before I, I let you go here? I'll just mention, um, and I guess in the summary to everything that I was talking about and everything that I was saying is that we we truly have a history that in rather than looking and being um, maybe feeling less special when you look into it, you're saying, oh, you know, I, th- I thought we would, there'd be something special in our past that makes me feel better about being who I am. Rather than thinking that, the more you look into who we really are and where we've come from, the more fantastic and more incredible it makes you feel. The way that it can empower you to realize who you are based on all of this ancient wisdom and all of what they knew about us and all of what they're trying to tell us about This incredible story that we've gone through from almost disappearing through catastrophes to just barely making it to where we are now and seemingly on the edge of a new story, one that combines certain technological and certain um, historical understandings into what I believe will be a place that we've never been before. And I'm excited to be on the edge of such a huge transition into another conscious time period in human history. And it's just, it's an honor to be here during such an exciting time. Amazing. Yeah, I agree. It is a very exciting time where uh, the shift in consciousness on this planet is opening up access to a lot of information that has just been waiting for us to go and retrieve it. And so um, thank you again for bringing that information today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you to all the deep divers, all of you who have gone deep with us today and explored this topic and and been very open-minded. Because again, a lot of what we talked about is, is not going to be wildly, widely accepted by mainstream academia, but, um, you know, I don't desire to be accepted by mainstream academia, to be honest, um, because uh, I want to continue to to search deeply within myself and out externally for for what resonates and how we can live the most joyful life that we possibly can. And yeah. I know that if you're listening to this podcast, you're on that journey as well. And so I want to say thank you. If this has resonated, if you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have, please make sure that you share it out. Uh, send it to a friend, a family member, have some conversations around it, and definitely share it out on social media and tag me, tag Matt, tag at the deep dive on any of your shares so we can reshare it and just see and engage in conversation with you. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you to all of you listening. Thank you, Adam. I want to remind you that always in always you are seen, you are heard, and you are loved. Have a blessed day. Thanks.